in the late 40s, after World War II, and I think it's triggered a lot by the whole phenomenon that changed our country in World War II, where women went to work. And all of a sudden they realized they could do stuff. So up until that time, doctors, educators, their predominant advice was put your child away, forget you ever had them, get on with the rest of your life. And we had a group of mothers in the end, late 40s, early 50s, that got together and said, there's got to be something else. They had learned they could go to work in the factories, they could support their family, and tragically many of them had lost their husbands in the war. And so they were now looking at uh, a whole different way of thinking and started in various places. We have this great argument in our movement of where it started first. New York claims it, Washington claims it, but however it happened, the late 40s came together and in 1951, we had the first national gathering of folks in Minneapolis. And out of that, it truly was an organization that started at the bottom and came together. We first formed a national organization, then we started forming state organizations. But again, it's a very loose confederation. It's not a top-down model. But it was those first early moms and dads that wanted to get something together. In Indiana, we had, uh, again, the same kind of argument. Marion County says they're first, South Bend, Lake County, Evansville. Everybody claims they were the first. Uh, there was about seven that formed right in the early 50s. And in Indianapolis, they pulled, we actually have it in the office, a little one-inch ad went in the Indianapolis Star, and of course the language was, we would consider very, you know, awkward today, but it asked for, and it just said, parents of retarded children. There'll be a meeting at the Indiana War Memorial Sunday afternoon, one o'clock. And these two moms that put it together, they just had this idea they'd maybe get 10 or 15 people. 300 people came. And they just sat and talked. So there was this huge undercurrent of people looking for this. And there was no internet to spread the word, no way of getting out. It was just this little one inch ad. So they got organized, got started. And it was a couple years later they actually then formed the Marion County Arc which then became Noble, and then those seven first organizations formed the State Association in 1956. Well, the, the ARC name is an interesting story in itself, and having been around for a lot of the, the changes, uh, we actually, when we came together in the 50s, there were groups that were called Parents and Friends of Retarded Children. And again, at the time, there weren't a lot of adults because most of our adults had been placed away in institutions. So it was that core group of families that started us who had younger children that were rejecting that model. And so when we came together in Minneapolis, the very first name was Association for Retarded Children. And it was very common at that time that people thought of their adult kids, too, as they got older, as children. So in the 70s, we went through our first change, and I came into the movement right at the time that debate was going on. And the move was from Association for Retarded Children to Retarded Citizens. And the whole effort around the word mental retardation was just starting to begin in the 70s, where people were realizing how negative and hurtful that was, but it hadn't reached that, that level. And so there was a movement at that time to just begin to get rid of the, the R word. And, but it didn't catch on, because we had the, a lot of old time folks that had grown up with it and said it's, it's not a bad word, it's a medical term and it's, it's just how people are using it. And it's also probably interesting to note that the self-advocacy movement in the 70s was just starting out. We had started out with citizen advocacy, which was Wolfensberger's third stage of advocacy, of teaching people to speak for themselves. But the idea that in the 70s, we still weren't listening, which is interesting because the whole civil rights movement 
was emerging at that time and the Voting Rights Act of 65 and all these things that happened. But we had pushed the rights of people through the system, but we hadn't extended it down to them within our own organization. And so it was in the 70s that some leaders started coming forward. And it was also interesting in the 70s because we had the very first youth ARC. Now, it was funny because being on a college campus in 1972, I remember seeing an organizing poster for youth NARC, which was our national organization, National Association for Retarded Citizens. So I remember walking into the dorm and seeing Youth NARC, wonder what this is all about. Uh, it wasn't real popular, but it was that youth movement in high schools and colleges that started reaching out to young adults with disabilities and just hanging out with them and doing stuff that other teenagers and young adults do that really, I think, spawned our self-advocacy movement. And they were saying to the adults, the parents, you know, you need to be listening to what your son's telling you. And it was really that, they became that bridge. Now, the youth movement ended in the 80s, and um, it's kind of interesting, and I think as uh, kids became more interested in themselves as opposed to others in the 80s, it was kind of a curious time. And it, it's kind of like now we've got through Best Buddies and Special Olympics, a whole lot more interesting things going on with high school and college kids. But that, that whole name change then, in the early 80s, we went to um, Citizens, and then we just went to ARC, where ARC doesn't stand for anything. It's not an acronym anymore, it's just a name. And that was a compromise, because there are folks that wanted to go to something totally different, and to not have any remembrance of metal retardation anywhere. And it's, it's just been an interesting evolution.